Hello, everyone. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Shirin Ben Zayed. I'm heading innovation at Finastra, and this is another live meetup we are conducting during our hackathon, Hack to the Future. Hack to the Future is a global fintech hackathon. You might have not heard about it yet. It's it has already over 4,000 participants from more than 75 countries and it is aimed to redefine finance for good. And you've got actually till December 20 to join and submit a project. For more information, feel free to check fintech.devpost.com. Now today we are discussing a very important topic, um, very aligned with the theme of the hackathon of redefining finance for good. We'll be speaking about sustainable finance. Uh, we'll cover a number of things there, why it is important, the regulatory framework, as well as all the change that this is bringing to the financial services industry. We'll also speak about some of the challenges that banks, financial institutions, and fintechs are facing there in terms of data, data management, as well as analytics, and how to measure the impact. Um, so along with these challenges, you'll see it's a great area of opportunity and a great area of innovation. And for this session, um, I'm really honored and excited to have along with me a great panel of experts um, that I would like to, to introduce to you, Start, starting with uh, Noemi, if you can please introduce yourself. So hello everyone, I'm Noemi Loer. I am a Vice President in Capgemini Invent. So uh, this is the Innovation and uh, Digital Transformation Advisory Entity of um, Capgemini Group. Um, I am in charge of sustainability for financial services. And before that, I spent 15 years in banking industry uh, in France and abroad. So I have a pretty uh, good view of what happens in, on the field. And I am very, very happy to be here today to discuss uh, uh, about this topic. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Naomi. We're really happy to have you with us today. Um, we also have Alexi, who's the um, co-founder and CEO of Greenbee. If you can please introduce yourself, Alexi, and what you do at Greenbee. Well, thank you, Shirin, for inviting me. So indeed, uh, I, I co-founded uh, Greenbee uh, um, just a year ago. And really, our ambition was to, um, um, you know, help everyone, uh, individuals, small, large companies, automate the tracking of their CO2 footprint, uh, essentially to, to address, I think, the discrepancy between our willingness to, to act against uh, global warming and the fact that we, we actually don't do much on a day-to-day -day basis. And so to do that well, we need to, you know, we can't improve something we don't measure. Uh, and today, the measure is very manual it's very consulting based so so we uh, we're working on tech to essentially automate this tracking we have this in an app and now uh, we have an api that works for for banks so that they can add a measure of carbon tracking uh, to their app to their payments and for companies so that they can assess their footprint but uh, i'll tell you more thank you very much thank you i'm sure we'll hear more about it um, thanks a lot, Alexi. And last but not least, um, we, we're really honored to have with us Mathieu. If you can uh, please introduce yourself, Mathieu, and what you do at Mazar. Yes, of course. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for being there. And thanks, Shirin. Uh, I'm very happy to be there with Noemi and Alexi to discuss on that topic. Uh, I'm Mathieu, but uh, I'm leading the, um, the, consulting, the banking consulting practice in Paris. Uh, and I'm leading uh, the sustainable finance practice for banks in Paris. Uh, uh, and I'm working with Leila Foxo in the UK. And yes, um, we've performed a lot of studies and webinars on that subject. And we're happy to share with you after. And uh, we're working with banks on that subject, on the regulatory framework, on the voluntary framework. So thank you uh, for coming. Thanks a lot, Matthew. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. So uh, my first question, actually, to start uh, the discussion about sustainable finance would be actually for you, Matthew. And um, if you can please share with us maybe a quick overview of um, the regulatory background to sustainable finance today and what's driving change, in your opinion. 
Uh, it's a very large topic, and we could talk about that uh, all the day. But we will focus uh, our subject on the uh, EU legislation. Uh, we'll take, for example, the, the EU action plan and the EU system of finance objective. So there are several objectives to support economic growth, to reduce pressure on the environment, to take into account social and governance factors, to disclose risks linked to ESG factors, to mitigate uh, ESG risks through appropriate governance. And the EU has committed uh, to three ambitious climate and energy targets by uh, uh, 2030. It is uh, a minimum of 40% cut in greenhouse gas emissions compared to uh, 1990s levels. Uh, at least 30% share of renewables uh, in final uh, energy consumptions, and at least 32.5% uh, person's energy savings compared to the business as usual scenario. So, uh, as you can see, is a big plan. And to go further in the detail, in fact, the the, the EU action plan talks about ten reforms in three areas. We we'll talk only on the three areas. So, is to reorient capital flows towards sustainable investment. Is to mainstreaming sustainability into risk management and is to foster transparency and optimism in the financial economy activity. So in the regulatory agendas, in fact, there is four major things that are going to happen. Uh, as you may know, uh, the EU taxonomy, uh, the, the, uh, the regulation links to sustainability disorder, or SFDR, uh, low carbon benchmarks, and EU green bond standards. So uh, these uh, different regulations are coming into force between 2021 and 2022. Um, so uh, it will be a big deal because this regulation uh, will impose major changes in the banks and all the invest industries. Uh, we can talk uh, of uh, one uh, major thing. It's not about the EU action plan. But it's about stress testing and it's about, about climate stress testing. Uh, there have been um, uh, exploratory scenarios and exploratory exercises uh, on, in all the EU banks. So we can talk about uh, UK and France. And this is major changes for banks, this uh, stress test scenario, this stress test exercise. No, thank you. That's a great overview, actually. Um, I don't know, Naomi, if you have anything to add there in terms of um, how regulation is driving change. Uh, I guess with all the constraints and the deadline, this is really driving us to, to move forward and to invest into the sustainability space. Uh, so first, I agree with uh, with Mathieu and with the role of, of uh, regulators. Um, I, I do more believe that... Um, the change started with uh, society and with uh, with politics, and now is moving to to regulators. And this is a good thing because we know that, uh, like Mathieu said, this is always a, a good trigger for financial services to move on. Uh, still, I think that um, I hope the conversation will be coordinated between the different stakeholders because um, we know that when regula regulators are putting stuff on the table, sometimes it's complicated for banks to uh, achieve uh, their uh, their financial objectives, and uh, this can um, have a strong sorry um, impact on on margins. This is what we saw uh, the last uh, years. Um, me, I just would like to, to say something more. I think that uh, financial services drives the way money flows. I, I, I think this is very important for the conversation we have today and to consider the role of uh, banks uh, in the society and in this topic. So I think they, they drive the drive uh, the way the money flows, and this is about still investing, financing, and, and, and protecting. And, uh, and since a few months uh, during the pandemic, we also uh, see that this is about distributing public money in one way, uh, and which is a good thing because this is something that they had to do um, to, to, to fight the, the virus. Uh, and so from my perspective, and, uh, and to make short, I, I think banks are used to be a little bit driven by change. And, and I think now today they can lead it. Uh, and like I said, I think money is the vector of action. So if you consider all these points, 
Um, banks will have to orient the money in the right directions. This will accelerate change. A and more a change, I think, that will have a role to play in transition. Um, and, and so I think that we are living fascinating time today because this is a great opportunity to transform. And, and, and banks are, are, are at a unique crossing. Um, they can support the change, accompany clients, and yes, the regulation are going to help that. And I hope they are going to facilitate that, not make it more complicated. Uh, and they need to do that in, the, in a responsible way, meaning that uh, we cannot be in a punishing um, politics, saying that we are going to stop financing this or stop financing that, because if we do that, we will have total, um, I mean, complete uh, part of the economy that will collapse. We will, have, we will have job losses and so on, which is maybe good for the environment, not good for society. So I think sustainability need to consider all the, the, the parts. Uh, so this is not easy, and I think banks have a role to play in this transition. Um, and yes, I think this is key in the conversation that we, we have today. No, that's really interesting, actually. So you touched on a couple of things. One of them is how this is really an opportunity for banks, uh, while usually regulation is, is heavy constraints on banks, and um, they need to comply with it, there are deadlines, it's... Um, it's and not very exciting topic, but here, uh, what you're saying is that this is really an opportunity for uh, banks to play a role, to redefine their roles as a bank and to uh, redefine finance and the role of finance. Is this something that you see a lot in your discussions or is it something that you are, um, as a partner, uh, to banks and financial institutions are introducing to them? Um, how do you see that really? Maybe how? What's the percentage of uh, banks, uh, in your opinion, that are more on the compliance versus um, driving change and redefining their role uh, strategically? No, I mean it's a reality on the market, uh, really, because uh, when we see, and today it's a crisis, right? I, I, I'm not <laughs> telling something that nobody yeah. knows. It's not a surprise. And despite the crisis, all the budgets yeah. that uh, banks still are, are still investing, sorry. Uh, are dedicated to this topic, mainly. I mean, cost decrease in one way, to be honest. And on the other side, we have a, a lot of projects on redefining uh, the purpose of the bank and, and, and then the strategy and then the trajectory and then the roles they want to play in the society and then how they are going to uh, uh, train uh, their sales and their, and their employees uh, through this path. So this is a reality and that's why I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, because it's not only something that is going to change, that, that is changing on the paper, and not only at a political or uh, discussion level, or even a regulatory level, a, 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 once again, it's very important, but it's really happening on the field. So that's, thing, that's, that's why I'm pretty, you know, enthusiastic about that. <laughs> now we see that. Um, Alexi, can you share with us your perspective as a, as a FinTech, and I know you've been working with the MPA Paribas and with many other banks, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, in fact, before creating Greenly, I was never a fintech expert, but the, the fact that we, we have uh, uh, the, this relationship that we were able to essentially uh, insert our tech into the BNP and Elo Bank app so that uh, uh, they could provide to their customers a, a carbon footprint calculator um, gave us a couple of insights as to, you know, um, um, how the, the banking sector was evolving on the front of climate change. So maybe just to add something to, to the question of regulation, um, um, the, what we do is possible because uh, there have been some important uh, regulatory changes in the sector. So everybody knows of uh, uh, PSD2, right? The, the banking uh, regulation that uh, um, tells banks that they should have APIs, that essentially your banking data uh, uh, belongs to you. Uh, you're allowed to, to use it in, uh, in other sectors. And so, you know, this is how we built uh, our tech at Green is we, we connected bank accounts to our app and then we looked at every transaction. We, we built essentially a green uh, personal financial manager um, labeling transactions, uh, estimating footprint, and so on and so forth. We did that in our app. And uh, this is an example of essentially a startup um, working on banking data. 
um, thanks to a regulation. And this uh, actually has an effect on banks at, um, at uh, um, uh, you know, um, as a subsequent time, because now they're saying, okay, well, uh, a lot of startups are starting to look at data in a way that we didn't look at it. Um, and so, you know, these guys have developed um, uh, analytics engine. Um, and so maybe we could actually use it inside our own app. So, um, so basically, you have the intersection of two trends, right? One is open banking and the other is uh, sustainability. And now, once we've done this, of course, we, we had, uh, uh, you know, what do I understand of uh, our client's motivation here is, uh, well, it's a top-down decision of saying uh, everything we knew needs to be uh, targeted at uh, helping our customers navigate the energy transitions. So individuals and corporations, uh, it's not just generosity, it's uh, well understood interest. Uh, so, I mean, in practice, what do you do once you have a footprint calculator in your app? Well, um, you are, um, uh, you know, a number of uh, green services are offered to you. Once you know your footprint, uh, then somehow you want to improve it. So. Um, and it turns out that a lot of uh, your uh, finances have an influence on your carbon footprint. So uh, when you buy a house, when you buy a car, when you buy a fridge, when you buy a television, very often you make a loan, right? And, um, and so whenever you have a major expense, uh, you need a bank and it has a major impact on your footprint because uh, your your banking loans right are not gonna um, have the same footprint if you buy a house that's uh, uh, th that costs a fortune to heat or inversely so um, creating this awareness inside the banking uh, user experience creates an opportunity to finance the transition is what I'm trying to say um, it creates an opportunity to to offer green financial products um, so maybe, you know, I don't want my, uh, all of my money to be invested in uh, the oil sector. Maybe I want to finance the energy transition. So I think banks are, what we are learning is that banks are learning to uh, help their customers um, with fi dedicated financial products. Um, and, um, and I think it's only the beginning because today, uh, essentially, it's an option and it's nice to have and, you know, um, but and we're doing it for individuals. But, um, you know, um, the tech that we're building uh, has applications for companies as well, uh, small companies. And now today, companies only have an obligation to track their footprint when they're very large, when they're more than 500 employees. Um, tomorrow, all of them might have it. And banks are getting prepared also to offer that service. So, so I see, the, you know, we I think we put a foot in the door, but I see a very, very large uh, avenue of um, services that um, uh, banks are going to start deploying to to help essentially um, make the investment of transitioning. Um, so I could talk on and on, but uh, for the, the sake of the uh, debate, uh, I'll let you guys uh, react to this maybe. <laughs> no, that's very interesting. So uh, what you described is basically how um, how banks can actually use the functionality that you are providing in order to, to be able to create opportunity with their customers and to help them um, get to those targets in terms of uh, sustainability as well. Well, I, I'm, yes, I'm saying that uh, much to my surprise, uh, banks were not spending that much time analyzing their own data, um, which is extremely rich. Um, maybe, you know, it was a choice. Maybe it was a regulation. I mean, uh, my, uh, my bank never wished me my birthday, you know, and, and maybe some customers would find this intrusive. But if you're, uh, you know, a millennial of sorts, uh, you kind of expect it. Uh, so... Um, you know, mentalities have changed and it feels like a lot of this uh, data not being an analyzed is a big loss. Um, it can be analyzed for credit scoring, it can be, but it can be analyzed for essentially environmental scoring. Um, of course, I think BNP in France is the first uh, big example of that. Um, you see this in the US with companies like Aspiration. So co-founded by Bill Clinton, 4 million users, um, uh, with an environmental and social score for every merchant. 
You see this in China with Ant Forest, which is a subsidiary of uh, Ant Financial, which has 400 million users. So it's actually the biggest environmental app in the world, uh, which essentially gives you a measure of carbon for every expense that you make. So, um, you know, it sounds like something very specific, but it's already concerning millions of people um, around the world. And the Chinese, uh, in fact, they are, are really ahead of us. So, so uh, we're one of the players bringing this to Europe, uh, and we, we certainly hope to be the, the main one. <laughs> no, that's, that's actually really interesting. So um, uh, you are touched on a very important point, which is the data, the use of data, and the challenge of the data with, when it comes to when it comes to um, measuring impact and uh, sustainability. Before we get to that, I, I just want to go back to another point that you mentioned about um, not only uh, managing this for individuals but also for um, companies. Uh, um, SMEs, corporates. Can you tell us maybe a bit more about that, and uh, how do you see it coming, maybe from a bank's perspective, to the corporate banking space? Sure. Um, so uh, you know, today, uh, at least in France, uh, but in uh, a number of other countries in Europe, uh, there is an obligation to track your footprint, right, along uh, uh, your direct emissions. So any gas that comes out of your operations, your cars, your your factories, your your um, um, air conditioning, your indirect. Uh, emissions uh, related to energy, so essentially your electricity, gas, and, and uh, bills, and then all of your indirect uh, emissions uh, linked to your different activities, uh, which could be, you know, your employees coming to work, which could be your, your purchase of goods and services, which could be how the products that you sell impact the environment. So it's a large topic. But in fact, when you, when you look at this, um, the way it's done today is a, is a very manual process that's Excel based, um, and you know you you essentially count the the uh, activity based uh, metrics and financial metrics, um, and and it's a, it's a process that works well if you are able to pay a consultant for uh, twenty or a hundred hours to to do it. So uh, the result is it's uh, it's pretty expensive, and only the large corporations can do it. Uh, our assumption is, um, you know, if we're serious about tackling climate change, everybody has to do it. Uh, but of course, you can't do it if it's really, really expensive. Um, so you have to find some way of automating it, which could mean that some of the metrics are a little less precise. Uh, but that's OK, because you have to focus on the big blocks that you can work on. So. Um, uh, and I think there's an untapped reservoir of efficiency in analyzing banking transactions of uh, companies. It's not the only source. It has to be complemented by extra analysis when you've identified the big pieces. Uh, but you can certainly do that. Um, I'm sure Mathieu or Noemi, I hope, won't contradict me when we we'll say, well, the technologies of aggregating bank accounts have been used to optimize auditing. You used to you know, uh, churn the, the bills uh, by hand. And now you have aggregators that kind of automate this. Uh, we're trying to bring this uh, to uh, carbon footprinting of companies. Um, and of course, the, you know, the, the core data that we look at is banking data. It's accounting data. It could be HR data. But the biggest piece, the banks already have it. So really, if they want to offer services to, to corporations uh, doing this, I think there, there's a huge reservoir of efficiency just uh, uh, you know, enlarging the offer to SMEs. Uh, in parallel, and we were talking about regulations, um, the, the thresholds for, obligated, for making a carbon footprint for companies compulsory are being lowered. Right, um, the fines are being increased. It used to be less expensive to pay the fine than to do it. Uh, since this month, it's now more expensive to pay the fine. So, um, um, and I think you know one of the proposals of the convention from the 150 citizens that were that had to think about um, the environment uh, was to generalize it. So I think if you generalize it with the current method, you're, you're, you're not helping really the economy, right? And it's already in bad shape. But if you generalize it once there is a tank that makes it really cheap, uh, then it's a, a home run. So look, this is what uh, we're certainly mm -hmm. betting our future on. But um, so I'm, I'm preaching from my own parish, but uh, I think it's also the, the sense of history here. No, so. oh, that's interesting. And, and back to the regulation and, and punishing regulation and driving change. Um, yeah. 
I'd like to get your thoughts, uh, Matsu, and knowing about this, uh, especially when it um, comes to data uh, challenges. Uh, how do you see it? Um, usually, we speak about when it comes to data and ESG and sustainability. We we always think of alternative sources of data, etc., and we we don't think right away of of the obvious, which is uh, transaction data, payment data, etc. How do you how do you see it on the on the bank side? Maybe starting, uh, yeah. Uh, with you um, uh, annoying me on this, and then we'll continue with Mathieu. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> first, I, I need to say that I am pretty enthusiastic about uh, what Alexis just described, because I think this is a real challenge for not only individuals, but uh, also for the non-listed companies or the small companies, the SMEs, to have a, a view of their impact. So if I go back to the measure, um, I, I think this is a tricky point, because banks need to understand where do they stand today, and how their uh, investing and financing lines are um, oriented. So are they clean or not, be clear. Uh, second, they need to uh, understand the impact of their decisions and, and need to include this type of uh, criteria in their decision-making process. For example, I, I, I borrow, um, I lend money, is this uh, clean money or not clean money? In terms, they need to be able to use data to uh, project their decision in the future and understand if they are going to reach their trajectory based on the decisions they are making today. And this is complicated because they need the data. Uh, and like we just said, it's complicated when you come to individuals or when you come to, uh, to SMEs. And I think there is a second challenge in the data. Um, so not only on the collection, uh, because data don't necessarily exist today, uh, but also on the the way they are going to use it to use them sorry um i think sustainability is systemic so you cannot only consider carbon because you can be very 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 clean on a carbon point of view and not clean at all on a social point of view and, and so um, it's very important to have the measure of the carbon and i think we need standard behind that uh, this is where the regulation is coming we need standard because it could be great if Greenly can have, um, I mean, can be the reference, I don't know, in carbon calculation for SMEs, for individuals and so on. And everybody use Greenly and that's fine because we uh, we all have a way to compare and, and to make decisions. So we need a standard. Uh, and, and second, I think we need to be um, more systemic. So being able to consider the overall impact of a company and, or, or uh, of an individual. And it's complicated because like we just uh, said, starting with only carbon, it's already very, very complicated. And I think Alexi uh, needed a lot of time to develop what he just developed. And, and I think he still have a lot of work to do uh, and that's good for him because <laughs> we, we definitely need this type of, um, of tool. Uh, but we also need uh, a systemic view. That's my, that's my point. And Mathieu, maybe you want to, I will probably want to complete. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think like Alexis said, I think that regulation is key because uh, even if, if it's not sexy, <laughs> but you have to understand it. You have to master it because you have to challenge it. And if you want to understand how it works, you have to understand regulation. For example, for the taxonomy parts, for the environment part in taxonomy, uh, in fact, you have uh, six uh, environmental objectives. Uh, and uh, for example, you have uh, uh, objective on biodiversity, on uh, pollution, on uh, circular economic transition, and so on. So, in fact, by understanding, it's, it's one an example, but it's to say that, like you said, Noemi, you can focus only on carbon and footprint impacts on that subject. So, uh, and it's other aspects of the regulation when you talk about transition risk and uh, uh, physical, ri physical risk in, uh, in uh, climate stress tests. So just to say that this regulation, how you can understand and challenge the impact, give you the key to how you will have to transform your data. And I think that's a good way to remind, I think, three major stakes for banks. Uh, and it's not only about regulation, but it's about sustainable and responsible governance. It's to align their strategy with sustainable development goals and best practices. 
uh, it's integrate ESG factors into decision making process and performance assessment, as you said, Noemi, uh, is promote sustainable and climate change culture and expertise. And that is a very major point uh, to nurture culture and expertise around all the banks. Uh, and I think it's uh, one of the key uh, of the transition is to the second, I think, uh, stakes and uh, challenge is climate and energy risk management. It's to include climate change considerations in risk management frameworks. It's to adapt risk policies for the identification, measurement and mitigation of climate risk, such as credits, markets and operational risk. It's supporting scenario analysis and stress tests for transitional and physical risk, as I said before, for short term and long term scenarios. And after it's big parts, which could include, for example, taxonomy. And taxonomy is to say what is green on art. And SFDR, it's climate and ESG disclosure and reporting. It's to incorporate climate change and ESG metrics in reporting. It's to align public disclosure with regulatory standards, such as the TCC. TCFD frameworks uh, and to incorporate climate change in PR3 disclosures, for example. So I think there's three major changes, and the data is the major, uh, it's the common points between these three uh, major challenges. And why it's a tricky point? Because, as you said, the data can be external and internal. And if you just about, if you just talk about internal data, it is shared between different departments, between ESG departments, between front office, middle office, back office, compliance, internal control, finance direction, fi uh, rest direction, HR, IT, uh, supply chain, and so on. So it means that if you want to use internal data, as Alexis said, you have to identify the capacity and the, and the potential of this data, but you have to break silos between these different departments. If we took an example in banks, for example, for BCDS uh, 239, so it was only for the finance and the risk department. And there, it's for all the departments, because ESG is not uh, a subject for ESG department anymore. It's a CEO subject. So it will affect our way of doing our job on all the departments that we have mentioned. But that is a very big point. And I think we to do that and to share this data, we have to have data governance. It's in the big world uh, for that, but it's quite logical who is doing what, who is controlling what on the data quality. And that is a very big part, which is a major issue between all the departments and all the the, the business of the banks, for example, retail, investment banking, asset management, private equity, insurance, and so on. So to have this data, to align this data is a big part. But should we wait for uh, the data to be clean or should we keep on moving and, uh, and define methods uh, and define measures? So it's clearly that even if we have data of poor quality, even if we have data that is that could be uh, more managed. So we have to keep on moving and to keep on producing, to keep on working on methods. And that is for the internal part, but we have the external part with the market that is going to change. Uh, for example, the, the, um, the, the ESG data providers or uh, performing major changes by acquiring different societies. And it's a major subject for them. Why? Because if you want to compare ESG data, the ESG data should be the same for all the actors. So that is a big point also. And the data, but to do what? The data is to uh, simulate, to modelize, for example, for climate stress tests, for uh, different trajectories and scenarios, for risk analysis, for portfolio management, for cash flow projection, and so on. But we have also a reporting part, for example, for SFDR, for TCFD, for taxonomy. And taxonomy, we talked about a lot, but it's the key. 
to see what is green or not. Because if you don't master regulation, you're doing greenwashing. And that is a big part. It's not, I think it's a, the objective of finance, um, uh, of uh, sustainable finance regulation are much larger than what ever been made before. Uh, when you see uh, the declaration of Mark Carney on the tragedy of the horizons, it's to rethink how banks are doing their job. So it's about accounting and so on. It's to redefining the banks. And that's what you said, Mami. Uh, Mathieu, uh, you, you've covered so many things here, <laughs> so I've got many questions for you and for all um, our uh, panelists here. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned is breaking silos and you mentioned that Naomi as well. This is something that we've been uh, speaking about for years now on, on uh, with the and financial institution. Is this really happening? Do you see uh, like... Uh, um, these regulatory um, changes or the investment in sustainability and redefining finance really breaking those silos because we have a real challenge when it comes to data. Yes, I, I think it's a reality because uh, first banks used, I mean, started a few years ago, but on different topics to talk uh, uh, everywhere in the company of some subject and to talk together on different topics. So, uh, for example, the KYC. So I think um, now it's not only about breaking silos internally, which is a reality and which is something that they are doing and they are trying to define the strategy at every level and to embed this uh, topic in every kind of level of the strategy and to break silos to share data, but to share the strategy as well and, as well and the objectives. But they also um, think about uh, working together. And I think this is key here because the data we are talking about is not only for banks. Uh, everybody needs it. Tomorrow, your energy provider will need it. Tomorrow, somewhere, someone else in the, in the society will need it. So maybe it's a very, very important data. Maybe it will have to be protected by the state. I don't know. Maybe it will be public. I, I have no idea yet. But I think this data um, on the sustainability part uh, is like a common good or a common need. So we need to, I don't know, imagine something. I don't know if this is blockchain or, uh, but we need to imagine something where this data will come together and will be able to be shared between all the parties and not only banks. And I think, we, I mean, in this world, which, uh, which is going to be pretty excited, is that um, every kind of sectors, we will have the same access to this type of data and we'll be able to do something. And I think this will work only if this is uh, done in a way to help companies and individuals to move through the transition. Once again, it's very, very important and insist because it's key. Uh, punishing won't lead anywhere. Uh, so, and, and everybody will be uh, ready to share the data if they receive some help in exchange, not uh, uh, a bigger uh, interest rate when they want money. So this is uh, very key here, but we need to think about uh, something more global than only finance and only inside the bank number one, not talking with the bank number two. No, that's really interesting. And I think you're, you're throwing lots of ideas for the hackathon participants here, lots of projects they could work on. That's really cool. Alexi, yeah, um, yeah. I'd love to hear your, your perspective to this. And no, actually, I, how do you see it really happening? From your side. No, I um, I agree with Noemi that uh, conversation is uh, larger than banks, especially that now everybody is becoming a bank somehow, right? Um, uh, with uh, open banking, uh, Google is becoming a bank, uh, Apple is becoming a bank, or maybe in the true meaning, an operator of payment, right? But uh, to the public, it's all the same. So um, Amazon is becoming a bank. So um, everybody um, is starting to gain access uh, to a lot of this financial uh, transaction data. Um, and, and I think um, in terms of, you know, uh, interesting collision, uh, which, which makes for innovation, is that these players, uh, players like us, uh, we, we, we don't see financial data as a, uh, like banks, because we, we see it as an opportunity to create new user experience. So it, it's less about the, the money or the, uh, it's more about what do we do with this data in terms of new services. Uh, 
Um, and and you see this very clearly with things like Apple Pay, you know, where it's all about uh, how fast it is to pay and and how much more info you have uh, at the moment of paying, etc. So uh, we're in this perspective, you know, of it's essentially enriching the data. Um, not, um, uh, so gaining access to it, measuring for sure, but then uh, doing something with it. And um, and typically, um, I, maybe I'd like I, I'd like to give a few examples of what you can do with it. So I, I gave our example of measuring, but but how do you um, at least when it comes to carbon footprint re reduce emissions as a result? So one of it is. Um, once you've identified, when you're able, once you're able to score merchants, you're able to suggest alternatives. You know, now we, you can link essentially um, a banking transaction to a merchant. You can add a Google ID. Once you have a Google ID, you essentially can put the merchant on the map. Uh, you can score him, and then you can compare him to another merchant on sustainability or social score, and you can also tell the user, uh, you know, that the other merchant is uh, 50 meters away and you can map his trajectory to this place. So it, it's it's this kind of uh, UX that's pretty, um, um, that, that's pretty um, uh, exciting. Um, you know, um, to, to many people, the thing that materializes uh, their bank is really their credit card. Um, so you, you see a lot of fintechs who, who, who give, you know, um, um, essentially uh, admin rights to third parties. You can edit corporate cards and set limits, you know, to every person. So, so we're working with um, players who want to set limits on carbon footprint. Now, not only am I allowing you to spend up to a thousand euros a month, but, you know, not more than one ton of CO2. So uh, how, how can you use this to, to limit maybe the carbon footprint of your, your professionals traveling uh, all around the world to, to do their business? Um, you can block certain merchants. Uh, you can create notifications. You can create uh, limits. You can, um, you can do some scoring. You can gamify. So, so um, that's you know not coming from the world of banking. Um, um, it's essentially, I was really uh, excited to to start working on banking transactions because uh, it looked a lot like what uh, I had worked on before at Withings. So with health data, uh, once new players come into play, they 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 find you know new use cases and essentially they end up gamifying uh, the data. Um, and uh, I think Noemi, you mentioned something about not uh, using data just to punish and you know constrain people, but how do you incentivize them? And I think uh, essentially it's finance meets uh, behavioral change, uh, which we all need to work on. Now that's very really interesting, and it's actually exciting to see your perspective to this. So opening it not only to banks and financial institutions, but definitely with banking as a service, everyone is a bank. Everyone is looking at how to possibly use that data. And also, what I uh, <laughs> I took some notes here: data um, as an opportunity to create a better UX, a better user experience. This is completely different from what we see with traditional banks, where usually data is a challenge. Uh, there are silos to breaks, there are regulatory constraints, there is innovation, of course, but um, there is all of these constraints around it. So it's really exciting to see that perspective and see that this is actually coming, or maybe you're already here. So really exciting times for data, for sustainability, ESG, impact. So. Um, I think we're <laughs> we're running out of time here, so uh, I just want to, to continue with another um, interesting topic that, and another question that I'd like to ask all of you, which is the impact of the pandemic. Do you see, how do you see it? We actually saw in some of the articles things around ESG falling down in terms of priorities uh, for investors. Is that something that you really see when um, working on sustainability projects with banks? And uh, uh, <laughs> Mathieu, it's for you. Uh, yes, uh, I think there is no uh, no stop at all. Uh, I think it's accelerating things because uh, by the pandemic, we are questioning our behaviors, uh, sense of what we are doing. And uh, that's why I think there is no stop uh, and it's accelerating by two things. And 
just an example, uh, I will stop talking about regulations, but um, you see that on the different regulation and the agendas, there is no stop and it was rather accelerating. You can talk about stress test scenario. It was this year and there was no stop, uh, no reports on that. Uh, we can talk about SFDR, uh, no stop on that. You can talk about taxonomy. So the the that's the, a good thing. So no delays yeah. in regulation with the pandemic. We're continuing. Yeah, and we have also see one thing that is very important. Uh, I think that was our different. It was no longer the subject of uh, uh, ESG department. It was a subject of CEO. So CEO contacted us and said about how my bank is ranked. What is my action plan? What can I do for that? And that is uh, a critical change. Um, and I think the pandemic, yes, is accelerating this uh, this uh, this topic. And, uh, and I think it's not going to stop uh, on the regulation point of view. And in, uh, I think, uh, about the, the image of bank, the way they communicate about that, I think is strong differentiators uh, between all the banks. No, oh, thank you. And actually, you've touched on a, on a point that uh, both Noemi and Alexia, I think, mentioned about uh, this being a C-level discussion, which is really interesting. Um, and Alexia, I'd be keen to hear your experience there. But um, Yeah, so um, sure. Um, it, my, my feeling is that, uh, you know, sustainability is moving from uh, uh, something you kind of had to do, but it wasn't like core business, uh, to something that's becoming very central. So, you know, kind of when uh, companies started going digital, the, the guy in charge of digital uh, uh, sprang up the ranks. I think uh, something similar is happening on sustainability. It's becoming a, a strategic uh, function. Um, and one of the ways that we see this materializing is, uh, I mean, just because of how we, we work is uh, to, to, to automate carbon tracking, we, we need financial data. So the person we, we end up talking to is really the CFO because he's the, the person who, who has access to the financial data. So, um, so, you know, it becomes a CFO uh, matter, if not a CEO matter, as Mathieu mentioned, uh, to, to authorize it. Uh, so, so that's one thing. And then to, to your earlier point, you know, how is the current uh, sanitary crisis uh, affecting all of this? Uh, you know, it, it seems very much like we, we are living a, a period of uh, acceleration, you know, of uh, underlying trends. Um, and realizing that, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, maybe it's not, maybe it is, but it, it, to people, it feels like the current crisis is kind of a, a warming, a warning for what could come. Uh, so uh, I think that there people are very much in a disposition to to hear um, uh, what we have to say in terms of uh, how can we add non-financial uh, measures to 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 payments. Um, and it probably explains why we have been lucky enough to, to, to go so fast at deploying carbon footprint uh, calculators with, with major banks like BNP and, and others um, soon, probably. <laughs> uh, by the way, what are the timelines, if you can share those? Yeah, basically, from the time you started discussion to the time it's in production. Uh, well, I can't share uh, too much uh, confidential information, but it went extremely fast. I mean, I've worked uh, as a startup with uh, big corporations before. Um, it, it's usually much longer. Um, I, I think a lot of work had been done already before we discussed uh, with our customer and they had essentially created the internal consensus. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes these discussions can take three years. Here it took uh, less than six months. So. Oh, that's impressive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's a great illustration, I think, of the fact that this is really top of the agenda of uh, yeah. banks and financial institutions today. Um, my last question to all of you, as we're getting really close to the end of the session, is how do you see um, what do you see next uh, for sustainability, and what do you see coming in the next couple of years? Um, maybe starting with you, Noemi. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so I had something regarding the pandemic because I, see, I think it's, in, it's important for um, what's 
is going to happen in the future. Um, I agree with what Mathieu and Alexis said, and I just want to add that I think now we can see the pandemic as a training, uh, because if we had a doubt uh, before that, now we know for sure that we are a system and that we are all connected. And this is what uh, is going to happen with, I think what is happening, sorry, with climate change. We are a system, uh, we are connected, and so we are in the same boat uh, when something bad is coming. Um, and the other thing that we learned with the pandemic is that we are also able to be pretty reactive, including in banks. And banks are not that, it's not a startup, right? It's a bank <laughs> and they are reactive. So what I see is in the future, um, I mean, what, and, or what I hope, I don't know, but <laughs> it starts with the hope, right? Uh, I, I think banks will become this new, uh, will play this new role I mentioned um of course they will keep uh, financing investing and protecting and i think protecting is going to be more and more and more important in the conversation they will move to a risk benefit approach to a risk benefit responsible approach which is very very different and i th i see them closer to the people um if they take the ball and they play they will be able to accelerate to support the change they will become the change and uh, I don't know, I see the world, a world where people love finance, you know, <laughs> which is a very, very different one than the one we used to have in the 80s, 90s, or even in the 2000 years. So um, uh, I see this world. And, and like I said, money is a vector to action. So thanks to banks, we will be able to act. So I hope they will play. That's the point. No, thank you. It's a very optimistic view, and uh, it's really I interesting. <laughs> Mathieu, do you agree with that? How do you see how do you see the future of finance? And yes, I hope also that we are playing that role for sure. I think that's we have to get something in mind that I think that the bank are convinced that sustainable investments are more profitable than the others, and I think that's the key uh, because uh, they have seen that in medium long term it's more profitable. So the, it's, I think that's one point. The second point, if we want to do that, if we want to break silos, if we have to have connected firms, it can be banks, it can be uh, industries and so on, uh, we have to nurture uh, uh, change management. We have to train people because I think the subject of sustainable finance is not well known at the moment when you talk with people. It's not very clear at all. And you have so much evolution, so much regulation. That's, I think we have to change the thing that sustainable finance is a subject for experts. Not at all. We have to diffuse, we have to broadcast uh, this knowledge to all the people, to, uh, to individuals, to firms, and every department. And I think it will be the only way to diffuse and to uh, to keep on moving on that subject, because I think it's a fact, the way we are working now is no longer possible. And I think the sustainable... ...the way of thinking in our, in our life in, uh, in, uh, in our job. So I hope that the future will be like that, but I think there is a, a real hope because I think that uh, banks and firms keep in mind that the sustainable way of doing things is the right way and the only way we can survive as individuals, but in an economic perspective. No, that's really interesting. That's the uh, doing well by doing good perspective. Um, Alexi, anything to add to that? How do you see the future? Sure. No, I, I think uh, Mathieu made a great point that, you know, the, this knowledge needs, the conversation needs to go from the experts to the general public. Uh, one of the, um, and, and, but you need, of course, the, um, uh, you know, the, the choice environment to be our, the, the, the architect of choice to, to make that possible, right? And it's the, the bank, you need to nudge people into making this happen. Uh, so, I mean, this is really what we're working on and, and we see it, right? When we, we tell people what's their kilograms of CO2 uh, emitted or avoided, uh, a feedback we, we get all the time is, uh, okay, great, uh, you know, but uh, I have no clue what this really means. 
So, um, uh, you know, a Frenchman is 12 tons of CO2 a year. What does that really mean? So, you know, uh, a, a full uh, grown tree could be a ton. Uh, maybe, you know, a thousand kilometer of car could be a ton. So these are things that people understand. But tons themselves, people don't know where they stand. They don't know what it means. So we need also, when I was talking about user experience, we need to disseminate this knowledge by uh, making it um, more easily accessible to people. And, and I think, uh, you know, uh, and we need also people to trust um, the, the metrics. Banks have done a great job to, to make people trust in them. It took them 400 years. So I think uh, we need to go a little faster in educating people about uh, their uh, carbon finances. So. <laughs> no, definitely. That's really interesting. Thank you all for all of these uh, insights. I think it's, uh, it was a great discussion. I've learned a lot with all of you. Um, just looking for questions from the audience. Feel free to post them on the chat, whether you're uh, watching us on LinkedIn or on YouTube, and we take them with, um, with our panelists. Um, as we are looking for questions, I have one actually for you, Mathieu. Um, back to the hackathon, and uh, Mazar is one of our um, partners and sponsors for the hackathon, sponsoring the special prize for um, the best environmental impact project. And uh, you're also one of our judges for the final. So I'd like to ask you, what are the innovations that you'd like to see out of this hackathon, and what would really make a winning project there? Uh, it's a large uh, subject, but uh, I think I will look at the practical way of uh, optimizing things for banks or the FS sectors, no matter what. But I think we it's so complex that we, we have to be very pragmatic on that and to see what we can do step by step to to optimize the way we are doing sustainable finance. So I think I will look at just one thing. I think a very practical, a very pragmatic project uh, to optimize things. And I think the area of improvements can be very, very, very wide. Uh, we, we talked about data, how we can use it, uh, how we can share it, how we can uh, simulate things. Just for one, one example, but one of my partners, show me an Excel file. Just, it was just an Excel file. But he was designing and optimizing cash flow projection with transition risks. It was five days ago, five days, five years ago. But it was even an Excel file. But I found it uh, very practical, very pragmatic on the way we can deform and project our cash flows by financing green projects in, in firms. So that's why we are living now with the taxonomy, with the scenario projection, with the cash flow projection. But things like that are very pragmatic, can be useful for firms, and help to one of the major goals is to uh, finance uh, green projects and to see the impacts of the financing on the cash flow of the societies. So just one example one of the examples would not be the, no, the one but just something very pragmatic and uh, useful for firms yeah 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 thank you i think the the session overall was very insightful for any hackathon participants here we've shared lots of ideas opportunities to um of projects they could possibly work on but definitely uh, be pragmatic think of uh, ways to optimize um, existing processes uh back to alexis point earlier also see how and think about how data can uh, can be a driver for user experience change. Um, so yeah, uh, definitely looking forward the the ideas and projects that would come out of the hackathon here in terms of sustainability and impact. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Noemi, Alexi, Mathieu. This was um, a very insightful discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you to all. all um, uh, those watching us on both YouTube and LinkedIn, thanks a lot for, for following us today. Um, I think it's it was just the start of the conversation. We can definitely go on for hours and hours to speak about this topic. Really exciting. Uh, definitely very timely top of the agenda for banks and financial institutions. So definitely lots of things coming on that space. Um, 
So I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, I'd like to call you also to uh, reach out to all of us here and to all of our panelists. Feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. I'm sure they'd be happy to continue the discussion with all of you. And um, join us on fintech.devpost.com for more information. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Last year, Hack to the Future brought together 1,080 hackers from 38 countries. 235 ideas were submitted and 122 published. Over 50,000 in prizes were awarded to the winners. It was incredible. Bright, motivated hackers from around the globe collaborated to build inspiring innovations in the world of financial services, from corporate and retail banking to payments and capital markets. Ideas and new solutions were born. Now, we invite you to Finastra's 2020 Hack to the Future. Hacking systemic inequality, embracing technology-enabled change, hacking through COVID-19. So, are you ready? Our challenge themes support inclusion and diversity. Help us amplify the voices of the unheard. Give the unprivileged the same access to tools and opportunities necessary to succeed in this life. Integrate physical and digital experiences. Find new growth streams and embed fintech across industries. Accelerate open innovation with a global developer community. Hacking around the clock, around the globe. We'll host virtual learning and network events and an online community where you can ask questions, share ideas, and get support. Enter for your chance to win prizes, like internship opportunities with Finastra. Waived fees for apps ready for our open innovation platform on fusionfabric.cloud and other incredible prizes from our partners. Go to fintech.devpost.com for full details and to get started. See you there.